All right, good afternoon. I'm Greg Niemeyer, and I'm so pleased to introduce Letters and Sciences 25, Creativity and Practice, a um, lecture series uh, and also a course. And I'm going to share a few slides um, of our coursework and uh, introduce our speaker for today, uh, my dear colleague, Alex Sound Pascal. And I'm being told that the uh, screen went dark, so let's see. Okay, that seems to work. Okay, so um, uh, we are going to um, contextualize this work a little bit because uh, what we've done so far in this course is looked at different forms of creativity from the very material uh, creativity of inventing new materials to the very abstract, which we're going to do at the very end of the semester, which we're approaching rapidly, uh, of uh, creating new sounds. And so we're right at the cusp of new sounds here with uh, new poetry and new emotions. And um, you know, this idea of creating a new format for new feelings um, is a very modern project. So back in the 1890s, uh, uh, Mallarmé created this beautiful poem called uh, Le Hazard, Le Un coup de dé ne, ja, ne, ne jamais l'abolira Lazar, which is uh, about French means a uh, roll of dice will never erase the concept of chance or abolish the concept of chance. And uh, the book itself is structured in a completely new way for the time, uh, and a, uh, a way that um, works with empty space as well. This is a manuscript, and this is the printed form. And uh, so although it looks like free verse and there's no kind of rhyme or meter, um, there is a deep structure within the poem and also within the way it's laid out. So uh, the sections of the poem here are uh, in, um, running into each other in different formats. Um, so on that page, you will see parts of different po poems coming together in new ways. And I think that's an excellent way to introduce uh, uh, Alexandre Pascal's work. Um, and here it is the printing press itself that is being retooled to create a new kind of page for a new kind of poem, which is to say a new kind of space for a new kind of poem. And uh, uh, in Alexandre Pascal's work, which centers on electronic literature, the device that conveys the poem is not the printed page, but rather the, the digital page and uh, or the digital screen and the software that is behind it. So a lot of um, Alexandre Pascal's studies and work has to do with understanding the new space of digital um, uh, digital media and the new kinds of poems that can unfold in that space. And so Alex is both an author and an artist and also a scholar who studies this kind of uh, discipline of electronic literature. And uh, as we know from uh, previous poetry studies, the form of a poem is very important. And sometimes the form itself provokes us to unlock feelings that are uh, hidden in our in our souls and uh, that we hide from ourselves. And so sometimes we look for a rhyme with a, for a word that rhymes with another word that already is on the poem. And in doing so, we have to search ourselves. And sometimes by association, we come up with things that would be hidden otherwise. And uh, so sometimes we look at, oh, I rhymed this with that. Really? That's kind of strange. But OK, I guess my mind is somehow there. And then we go with that. And then uh, new forms of expression arise. So uh, the question is, what kind of structures elicit what kind of new feelings to manifest? And uh, uh, we talked about this a little bit, about this idea of um, poems then moving us from places of one feeling to places of another feeling. So we might read a poem and it starts with a one kind of mood and ends with a completely different mood or makes us think about the way the poem started in a different way. And so uh, uh, when we look at uh, the work of Alexandre Pascal, uh, the form that the poem takes place in is, is oftentimes the uh, a, a, com a computer form and like a literal form, the one that you fill out. And uh, Alex Cow calls it concrete poet, uh, corporate poetry. And this corporate poetry is, uh, uh, to me, a very new form of uh, communication. It's a really exciting way where we see that we take a, a rigid structure and transform it subversively into something that it's not even meant to be. So uh, Alex San Pascal is a artist from, from Spain originally, studied in uh, uh, Granada, Spain, uh, first interpretation and uh, translation in 2007, and then uh, did a degree in foreign languages and pedagogy in 2009, and eventually a PhD in Hispanic studies in 2012 at the University of California, Riverside, which is actually a really wonderful campus to study in. 
you have a good time there? Yeah, see, many people have a great time there. So, um, so and then after that, she uh, joined us at UC Berkeley and published a book uh, called Postweb, Crear con la Máquina en la Red in Madrid, uh, published in Madrid in 2018. And that book is both a scholarly work, but also a, a creative work and kind of a, a manifesto for uh, digital uh, poetry. So Alexandre Pascal is now an associate professor of Spanish and New Media at UC Berkeley in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She teaches contemporary Spanish literature and culture. And uh, uh, for her, uh, an online form, like the one you fill out when you do a Google form or when you sign up for something, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity uh, and a platform to create a new kind of interactive poem. So the, the content of a form often has a lot of preconceived notions about what people ask you about, right? There's a rhetoric of um, what is your name? What is your first name? What is your last name? And that rhetoric can, uh, tells a certain kind of story, even though it seems like they're asking us for information, they're actually telling us what to think about. And so that's the starting point of, a, of an interactive rhetoric, which uh, uh, Saint Pascal is using for to great effect, as you will see. So join her talk to hear about the creative path of using formal constraints to unlock creative energy and honesty. In her ongoing series, Corporate Poetry, she engages these corporate tools, as we mentioned, for off-label ad off adventures, both in form and content, and gets inspiration from using common tools in unconventional ways to unleash a new poetics. And I hope you ga get that inspiration from her work as well. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Alex Saint Pascal. There we go. All Thank right. You. you ready? You good? Yeah. Uh, let's see how so, Oh, actually, let's just do something like this. All right. Um, let's see. I need to. I have my talk in here, so. <laughs> and, all right. Can. Okay. Can you hear me? Great. So I want us to, to play a game, OK? And we're going to pretend that I am the, the CPO of an imaginary company called Corporate Poetry. And just imagine that I'm here to present to you the launching of a new poetic prototype called Corporate Poetry. And as with any new product, we are going through a stage of product concept testing to help us me evaluate what ideas are more successful what poetic concepts are better, right? And I want you then to participate in this and evaluate this game. So please pull out your phones, you know, it's contactless, um, <laughs> gaming, whatever, and scan that for me. And take the test. My test sounds scary, there's nothing evaluate, well, there's a lot of evaluation, but you're not going to get a grade or anything. You're not going to fail. <laughs> and you should all be in a screen with talking about ants. You can scroll to the bottom and start the test. It'll take you about four minutes in which I will be awkwardly standing here looking at you. You be anything you want. You could lie. Really? Yeah, maybe it's overwhelmed so many millions of people taking the test at the same time. Great, thank you.
You have about two minutes. And when you are finishing, you could raise your hand or something to let me know. I love to see you taking this very seriously. Okay, one minute. All right. You should all more or less have reached this page, though the options you evaluated were all slightly different because the poem is randomized. However, I imagine that most of you were paying more attention and reading a little bit more slowly at the beginning and then quickly started to lose interest and <laughs> sped through because that's what happens with repetition. And although there's something we can say about our attention economy in relation to that, um, what I really want you to focus on this moment was of the experience of testing and how you know, our testing goes through different stages of evaluation as well. But you are actually in this poem, and as it is a poem in itself, and I am a poet, I'm going to read it for you. And here's how it says. So potential ideas and other things that live in your gut. One, growing a human, growing its parts until it parts. Two, human exit, leaving inside someone else's body until no more. Three, coexisting with humans. Once out, you look for an in until it's done. Four, coexisting with the tiny in your gut, which may or may not be human, probably not. The average American adult harbors approximately 1,200 different species of bacteria in their gut until they are not. Five, Coexisting with the tiny on your skin, more than 8,000 bacteria live in your tongue. And like humans, when happy, they behave until they don't. Six, coexisting with the tiny in your groin or your armpit. The rest of your external you is salty and dry, desert you. Seven, growing a Staphylococcus epidermis, planting a bunch of grape-like berries on the outermost skin. Yet neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, only the one who grows until the one is none. Eight, hosting a Streptococcus salivaris, feeding the tiny in your tongue so they can feed on you. Then release the ocean breeze. Exhale. <sighs> Feels really good. Nine, creating minuscule worlds for you to live not until you die and then you do go on and feed those bugs. 10, growing bacteria inside someone else, 
bacteria from the mouth might travel through the bloodstream and reach the developing other in utero through the placenta. From mouth to blood to alien gut. 11. Feeding demographics. Always optional until it's not. So now that you have read the whole list or you've heard me read it, feel free to go back and take the survey so you can see new options and see more of my beautiful doodles and then you can evaluate more and give me more data, right? Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're giving me and Qualtrics more data. You see, this whole poem is built, stored and distributed using Qualtrics, a cloud-based subscription software platform so for something called experience management, which I'm sure you're very familiar with because it has a wide distribution in academic settings. And you've all received, I don't know, university emails asking you to rate your morale or your style of teaching and working from home and things like that. Um, the thing is, Qualtrics is very good at doing that, right? Uh, and it was, in fact, the first employee management platform to measure employee experience through something called predictive intelligence, an algorithmic process by which the collated data, your answers, it's distilled and interpreted automatically and then propose new predictions on how to collect more data. But don't worry because the data that you're providing them and me with is too random to make any sense, though that doesn't make it worthless, of course. Reading through a mask is so exhausting. These processes were first designed as a marketing tool called predictive marketing. But as a matter of fact, and as you have experienced during the pandemic, Qualtrics surveys have been distributed for everything and they have been used in every possible field of study that has anything susceptible of being measured. And today, that means everything, everywhere. In times where Qualtrics surveys were sent to me to measure my emotional state uh, in response to a global pandemic, as well as, of course, you know, to rate my fantastic teaching style, I wondered about all the other things that could potentially resist being measured. How can life defy numeration? Is it even possible? Can new life escape it? Is this what poetry is supposed to do? Can the logics of poetics escape the impulse to calculate experience? I guess this poem is a little case study in that, but I didn't know it until I started working with the platform itself and I started exploring its language its affordances and constraints, and my own. I was also pregnant at the time, you see. So the idea of me being one and many, the idea of thinking of my own body, the limits of my own body, my constraints, my limitations, and others, was sort of on the back of my mind. And this is what I want us to reflect about today, about our own positionality, and about how the tools we use shape, afford, and constrain our thinking and how that thinking relates to our feeling and our creativity. In other words, how we may think. And I have been thinking about this a lot. And by thinking about this, I realized that my idea was not original in any way because I was only rephrasing something I had already heard. And I was thinking about a famous essay by a man called Banavar Bush. And for all of you who don't know who this man is, up here, full disclosure, was one of the scientists behind the creation of the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. But that same year, in 1945, he also wrote an essay where he decided that he should refocus his thinking away from the war and think about the need to adequate our informational technologies to the type of informational and scientific thinking of the time. He complained that most technological developments up until then had been dedicated to extending human's physical reach, so like a telescope to expand our vision or a jet to be you know, super fast and get there faster, but had forgotten about extending our thinking and researching capacities. And that had created a certain type of asynchrony. So two realities that did not belong in the same time. To solve this problem, he imagined this machine, the MEMS, not a war machine, but a type of mechanical desk that would be able to collect, contrast, share and expand humanity's knowledge. The machine never came to be because you see, he was thinking beyond his time. But many say that Ted Nelson was inspired by it when he created the hypertext or that Douglas Engelbart was when he created the mouse. You remember mouse, like mice, I guess? 
I mean, I feel nobody uses that anymore. A few years later, though, in a very different context, Adelaide Morris edited a book called New Media Poetics, Context, Technotets, and Theories, which I believe was one of the first academic essays on digital poetry, which is what I do. And she wrote it, and in the introduction, she wrote an essay called As We May Think slash How to Write. And guess what? She also thought about our friend here, Vannevar, but of course, she also thought about a poet, the poet Gertrude Stein, who apparently, and taking into consideration that she was also thinking about the war, but World War I, um, was also complaining that we were thinking at least several generations behind ourselves. Or, as Morris Cut said, that what we do and see does not match the inscriptional or representational conventions through which we think. And oh my, of course, you can imagine when I read this, it's like I had little light bulbs turning on my head. And as a poet and as a literature professor, I think of writing as our main inscriptional and representational convention. So obviously, I thought that what Morris was saying, what all these different folks were saying, was that traditional writing did not reflect how we were thinking anymore. And so that we needed to reimagine writing so it would reflect how we think. So I know this was a bit of a tongue twister, but it makes sense, I hope. And guess what I did? I wrote an essay, of course, and I called it As We May Think, where similarly to what I would do later with the Qualtrics poems that you've just experienced, I thought about the possibilities I had then at my disposal to write in a way that truly reflected the representational technologies through which we were doing our thing. Instead of, instead of writing a Word document in my computer, but because I was in my computer, I immediately thought about writing on YouTube because it seemed to me at the time that that was a big platform that was structuring a lot of what we saw back in 2018. I imagine now it would be TikTok, I don't know. Uh, and, but I saw that those videos on YouTube, they were, of course, informing folks' opinions about many things, but they were also teaching their brains how to think their algorithms creating conceptual relations between different content and, and so on. So it wasn't just that we needed to be writing using the right inscriptional mechanisms, it was also that the representational technologies we were using were changing how we wrote and how we thought. So let's just watch it. Hope the sound goes. Hay quien dice que vivimos de año a la sincronía, aunque la manera en la que percibimos los fenómenos cada vez más tecnológicos, y la manera en la que percibimos los que pertenecen a otro cuadro tecnológico. Porque compilé una lista de cosas que son todavía necesarias como la de diatoms, de escalas y diferentes tipos. HIV infectan a que vivimos en un momento de asincronía. Sí, la manera en la que percibimos el mundo cada vez más tecnológico. 
The eyes of a honey, la manera que la hoja está mostrando, que pertenece a otro mundo. Compilé una lista de cosas que son todavía inaccesibles a la hoja de mapas en esta chair, en este sillón comfortable. Y hay un honey bee que está mostrando que está mostrando que está question really so what did you see what came to your mind how did it make you feel if anybody wants to answer you yeah mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to rephrase that in case it didn't pick up. It's okay. I mean, I can, you know. I know, I know. I, I, I realize. But anyway, so it's fine. I just, I just rephrase that. You know, somehow the question of infinity made you feel comfortable, which is interesting. But it is supposed to be a very confusing uh, video. And a lot of it has to do with sort of the main topic about this, which was invisibility, of course. And how we see the only things that the platforms through which we're seeing allow us to see, right? And I'm specifically talking about platforms, but these are extensions or particular materializations of other types of structures that mold and conform our thinking, such as, of course, ideologies or the status of us and apparatus. And, you know, technology is a human creation and is embedded with the ideologies of those creating it. So no technology is neutral, obviously. And as Kate Hales very nicely puts it once, the function follows the form, which, right. here it is, is another way of saying that embedded in every tool is an ideological bias, a predisposition to construct the world in one thing rather than another, to value one thing over another, to amplify one sense or skill or attitude more loudly than another. And I say this because I like to create with platforms that I don't design. It has a lot to do with knowing that I live in a world I did not design, with structures I did not design, and that many times I find oppressive. These technological structures redefine things like intelligence and truth, fact, memory, or even history. Hale says it commandeers our most important terminology all the worlds we live by, and it doesn't pause to tell us. So we sort of don't see it happening with technology. And when we're thinking about making art or literature, I like to identify a particular signifying structure and then see where it takes me. If I dare to actually look at it, to take a moment and pause. Once I do this, the structure sort of brings itself to life and brings associations to my mind. I will show you a few more examples of this by returning to the beginning of the presentation. In 2020, I was a poet fellow at the Arts Research Center here at Berkeley, 
And I began to work on this project that Greg was talking about called corporate poetry. I was interested in seeing the relation between corporate language, which I understood as a language that organizes our reality within corporate spaces, and that other corpora, right? The corporal reality that is our body. And this is when I started to get interested in service and the many connotations that surveying had also in terms of controlling and gathering info on measuring, on explaining those measures, and on making things visible or invisible, on commandering, commandering our terminology, let's say. And I decided to work with tools that sort of everybody, more or less, knew how to use and see where they would take me. And I wanted to experience how these tools related to my thinking, feeling, and locate that thinking feeling, particularly in their proper structures. That's it, my body. To see how, in other words, thinking was embedded and was related or depended on the body, on the corporal, not the machine, but me, and also the representational and inscriptional mechanism of the tool, maybe this is a corporate part of the title, through which we think. A good way to think about this question, too, was to pose it in terms that Andy Clark calls brain-bound thinking, where thinking on cognition happens mainly in the brain, sort of predating any a relationship with a tool, or extended cognition, where thinking is part of a larger system that happens outside the body, right? Think, for example, of doing math. I mean, I, I don't know math, but I guess people that do follow the equations, and they're thinking as they're writing in a notebook with a pen or whatever tool they're using, and new formulas, new equations keep happening as they're thinking because all the mathematical thinking cannot happen without the tools. So according to the second model, thinking happens with technology together, even if the technology doesn't pause to tell us. And if this is the case, it would seem tremendously important for us to pause a minute and look at those tools that help us think, that shape our thinking, that change the way we see the way we feel and name the world. So I decided to explore this question using surveys to write poems, as I mentioned earlier, and as you explain, as you experienced. So I'm going to show you one more example, and I'm going to read it with you. I need to do this ending the show. So I hope this works. Yeah. All right. See that my screen is terrible. I always talk about poetry as if being in a room. This is how I've been trained, at least. It is usually a white room, bright salt, dark cobalt blue, rich mineral soil. I'm usually alone in that room, but like salt or cobalt, you have been here before, and like you, others. We all live traces, sweet water, monkey form, form or not. Some of us disappear into the earth inside a little and turquoise box with vintage yet millennial pink flowers around the edge, into a progress bar, mint green below, into a cycle or circle of completion. Some of us are made to disappear. What does it mean to disappear? Does it look like this? Dash, 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 dash. Or like this. Dot, 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 dot. Or was it this? Disappeared. I never liked pears. They are gritty a mouthful of syrup, and fun. Or this. Spain lurched truth commission to probe Franco-era crimes. The Spanish government system will open its midst 12,100 madmen. Smirked 100,000 of French evil war and it's buried in mud spray Spain, Amnesty International. A since sat to begin splits with Y2P and CS2 missing persons, mass graves. 
How do you make someone disappear? Where do you take them? What do you tell them? What do you do with their hands, their feet, their teeth? There's hundreds of thousands of hands and feet buried under freeways, dams, and playgrounds in my country. His green teeth will never be collected. I sometimes think about poetry as if formed or formless or form. Those hundreds, those thousands were not traces, were diamonds with Lucy, were true salt, were something close to baby sky hue, and no more buried cobalt blue. So you might have recognized this tool. It's a survey monkey. Now, by the way, also called Momentive AI. We can talk about that later. But as the poem itself goes, right, I'll tell you that when I began to write about it, I was thinking about poetic structures, the type of thing that Greg mentioned at the beginning, things about the difference between poetry and narrative, about plot-driven writing and tonal writing, about building with forms, because that's what poets do. You, know, you measure, you count, you create within a form. But, and it's true, the poem itself starts like that, and you know, it's quite reflective. It talks about the green progress bar at the beginning and so on. But as I was dipping deeper into the form and new options were being suggested to me, I couldn't help to notice the limits of the prefixed options, the limits of the form, let's say. And new thinking started to happen. For those of you who don't know, SurveyMonkey is an online survey development cloud-based software as a service company that was founded in 1999, which is sort of internet for history. Just as an FYI, Google Forms didn't appear until 2008 as a sort of addition to Google Sheets. It is also a big company that went public in 2018. And this may not seem very relevant at first, but it makes sense when you start playing with the platform and feel the immediate constraint of free versus premium features. Money and data and the stock market and all their invisible violence came to my mind again. And perhaps because I, like most of you, live in San Francisco in the Bay Area, I can't stop thinking about money and <laughs> wealth inequality. But I, like not so many of you, I'm originally from Spain, where I grew up in the 80s and 90s during the country's transition to democracy after the death of dictator Francisco Franco in 1976. It may be strange for some of you to imagine who've gone to study abroad in Madrid or Barcelona to think that that country suffered under a violent fascist dictatorship for almost 40 years, ended in the mid 70s. And well, this poem explores precisely the question of the about 140,000 missing bodies that to this day, 46 years after the dictatorship, are still missing. And I say more or less because there's no official account, because there has still not been any formal state inquiry into the missing bodies. And this makes sense if you understand how the country undertook its process of so-called democratization, where in order to leave this very dark past behind, a general law of amnesty was passed in 1977 that exonerated any crimes committed during the Civil War and the following dictatorship. Just think, for example, in comparison of what happened in Germany with you know, the Nazis. This has become known as the Pact of Forgetting, an institutional attempt that is reflected in the popular behavior of putting sort of the past behind us in order to focus on the bright democratic future of Spain. So I grew up in the shadow of this pact. And like all Spaniards of my generation, was taught not to look back, to learn how to coexist with secrets by not asking too many questions, by never digging too deep. I mean, you really don't want to find out if your neighbor was a torturer that killed your uncle, or do you? Surveying people about their feelings about mass graves was perhaps my own way of breaking with my previous generation's pact. I'm asking questions and I'm counting the data, but not all of it. SurveyMonkey offers powerful analytical tools, but a lot of their inner workings are pretty opaque to the average user. And honestly, it may be just me because I'm really not very technical. 
to me, I don't understand how their analytics are done. And like I said before, a lot of its premium features are behind a paywall that I refuse to pay. So I couldn't help connecting the dots between these two different structures. The commercial survey platform that turns all interaction, and in the case of this, because it's a poem, affect, emotion, feelings, into obscure and numerical data, and the sociopolitical and institutional packs that in my country have also successfully turned death into unworkable data as well. And I decided to collect my data and create two new poems. In June 2020, I shared publicly the results of the open-ended statement verse that you saw. Some of us are made to disappear, where you could type in whatever you want. And I recited them in a YouTube performance I called Backroom 2, a response poem. This is in YouTube, you could watch it later. At that time, I had already run out of all the free analytics that SurveyMonkey offers for their own paid plan. <laughs> so I decided to go ahead with this portion of collected data, because like I said, I'm used to working with incomplete data sets, just like coexisting with those. A month later, I took the same data set collected from Room 2 and wrote another poem entitled Made to Disappear. I shared the visualizations provided by the service, the pie charts, the graphs, the tables, and wrote an interpretive report published both in digital form and print in the German Austrian magazine Perspective. These are some of the graphs that the poem shared, and this is the report. And again, it's a poem, so I'm going to read it to you. What does it mean to disappear? I asked this question to a self-selected group of 44 anonymous participants during the months of February to June 2020. 40.91% of them understood disappearance to mean disintegrated into three short and consecutive dashes, and out of which dash, 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 or perhaps in of which, dash, 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 100% selected a single dot to contain the fleeting essence of what they mean by void. Unfortunately, the data revealed some discrepancies about which exact dot, 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 dot reflected best the respondent's sense of disappearing. Alas, here lay the limitations of representing the incommensurable vastness of the universe was using that. Faced against the limits of human comprehension, 23 participants believed non-existence to take the shape of a fruit, i.e. a pear. More significantly, 56.82 of respondents selected masquerades as synonyms of disappearing, while 43.18% confirmed that there's hundreds of thousands of hands and feet buried under freeways, dams, and playgrounds in their country. I never understood numbers, thus I can only confirm that dash, dash, dash equals mass grave. In that same magazine, I explained that most people don't understand large numbers, and that's why we turn to visualization. When it comes to digital interfaces, their hermetisms has made almost impossible to know what lies behind them because images are impenetrable. What algorithm powers them and what is behind that set of instructions is almost impossible to know. And looking at a compact set of soil is not that different when you're not allowed to dig and exhume the bones buried there. Made to disappear, this backroom poem plays with the irony of this kind of visualization. I show readers' responses in a quantifiable way in order to write a report that ends up being as compact and obfuscated as the reality that he refers to. This is not an interactive poem in any way. It belongs to print. It is static and unchangeable, reinforcing that famous dictum that print is flat and code is deep. The atrocities this poem deals with have remained carefully trapped under Spanish soil, rendering the land as flat as print. There is no digital depth in which to dig anymore. You'll realize this is the trope that I have been working with over and over with different iterations. And I'm talking about the possibilities of seeing through form, and in particular, through the mediation of digital forms. As media theorists David J. Butler and uh, Richard Grusin say, our reality becomes remediated by the digital media technologies whose 
logic of immediacy dictates that the medium itself should disappear and leave us in the presence of the thing represented. In other words, they should make us feel like we're indeed sharing someone else's space, someone else's room, and not just looking at them, looking at you, looking at your screen. So hello to whoever is watching this on YouTube later. In immediacy or not, these walls are not really invisible. They are not immaterial, as I pointed to earlier. And even if digital technologies have also long insisted on their ethereal constitution by being able to traverse the world and materialize in your phone, in your computer, or even exist in something fluffy like a cloud, as the logic of immediacy of the digital interface becomes more and more advanced, the more impenetrable the hardware and even the software becomes, the harder it is for us to see it, even if we pause. As Laurie Emerson puts it, the degree to which an interface becomes more invisible is the degree to which it is seen as more user-friendly and so more human, but at the cost of less access to the underlying flow of information or simply the workings of the machine medium. The invisibility of the machine slash medium makes us believe it might not even be there, but let us remember that there is nothing immaterial about digital technologies which are not only made from real minerals like cobalt mined in inhumane and unregulated conditions in Africa, think of my poem, but are also responsible for levels of environmental pollution close to the aviation industry. 4% of all global CO2 emissions are a result of our internet usage. So think of that next time that you stream a stupid video. It's a real bummer. The cloud and all the rooms that magically pop in our houses are thus not only very material, but also very alien, since they are sustained by rare minerals that come from all parts of the world and the planet and that go and through large infrastructure surrounding the world in a highly distributed manner. Namely, the marine cables that crisscross the world's oceans, the global servers that share information and that heat up the land where they sit, the local telecommunication systems powered by dirty electricity and along, etc. But also because even in the most domestic manifestations, let's say this phone or your computer that runs the software that opens up that familiar chat room, is never quite ours. The software that runs and constitutes the digital medium builds the space we're now allowed to sit in, while other hidden software and larger, but also concealed hardware infrastructures permit it. There is, of course, something inescapably po poetic about this about a structure that creates a room for us to sit. But this is also perverse, because these organizational structures that allow us to work remotely, survey, or chat with a loved one, are, according to their own parameters of interaction, all have built-in information gathering technologies that feed on our usage. They're not only building new rooms for us, they're also spying on us dwellers by methods most of the time we don't understand. So thanks to the heightened experience of domestic virtuality that we've all experienced this past year, years, I don't know, I realized survey forms were probably the best example of this double functionality because they're meant openly to gather user response data, while at the same time, they use that data to feed their own analytical capabilities. And although this is not a secret, the way most companies retain the data we collect for, for them and how they use it is still quite opaque. I mean, of course, you can, and I invite you to do that, browse the privacy policy of any service and even restrict certain collections. But let's say that our personal sharing is the fee that most of us willingly pay to visit with a friend or have them visit with us. We may even feel uncomfortable about it, but we're willing to stay in the dark, like those mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo or to keep certain things hidden, like a cable linking LA and Taipei, in order to justify our usage of these technologies. Like I said, I am a woman who grew up in Spain during the country's transition to democracy after the death of a dictator. So I know a thing or two about burying silences and to the many tacit pacts that we're willing to make to keep uncomfortable and destructive truths in the past and in the dark. Perhaps that's why I have devoted most of my academic and creative career to writing about 
formal structures and the correlating physical infrastructures and how these structure how we are, how we think, and how we feel. Like I said earlier, I also happen to live in the San Francisco Bay Area in the shadow of Silicon Valley. So my interest in that particular type of alchemy, ideological alchemy, that turns the worst material conditions into something evanescent, like a cloud, has necessarily taken the shape of digital technologies. These two personal conditions, a place of living and a place of birth, may not seem too related at first, but as I've come to see, and I hope that was able to explain to you a little, the silences that we keep in the pursuit of progress have more than a few things in common. If thinking happens with things, making things be seen, working through them, with them, against them, with their constraints and their affordances, may allow us to think differently, to feel differently, to live differently, and hopefully to live better futures. Isn't that what poetry is all about? Thank you. Wonderful talk. And uh, we now have a, a few minutes for questions and uh, we can always check with questions online. Did you get any? And if you have a question in the room, please raise your hand and there's two or three of us are going to give you a microphone. So no, no, no questions online yet? Yeah, please do. Yeah, let's start there. Comment online. Um, Belinda Kremer says, I am fascinated as a fellow poet so admiring the disappointment I felt as I re-encountered the same questions while experiencing your poem, Poetic Experience. Incredible. You are creating a totally unexpected experience for the reader viewer. I totally get the meta commentary in the way you're playing with the previously shaped results, which are so prescribed by the provided responses, but you are also doing so much more here. Wow. Oh, wow. That's my comment back. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Question of form is very interesting. Always. I mean, when Greg and I were talking about this at the beginning, right? We were talking, and Greg thought that it was interesting to think about the feeling and then how do you translate that into a form. But for me, it's always the opposite. It always works the opposite way. Uh, you have the form, and that allows us to be the water that shapes through the form. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you started your talk with an interesting observation, uh, which is that uh, you the difference between repeating a thought you heard before mm -hmm. and thinking your own thought. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to reflect on that a little bit and ask, uh, when are you aware of the fact that you're thinking a new thought? And it, clearly you are, and there's no question about it, right? And but there must be a moment where you're like, oh, this is new. And uh, how can, how does that feel? And how, how do you know that you're in a new space? I don't know. That's the problem. A lot of uh, the times, I mean, I actually, when I was writing the talk and I thought, oh yeah, this is going to be cool. Haha, <laughs> this idea. <laughs> and then I thought, as I was walking into the auditorium, they've all heard this before already. I'm just not going to say anything interesting. It's the same ideas. Everybody has thought about. How can they not? If I thought about it, it's just repetition, right? It's just repetition. So I, and in a way that's also liberating because they're not my ideas anymore, right? And I feel it's okay, it's just repetition. So go ahead and copy the forms, do the surveys, write your own poems, think the same thing because nothing ever really belongs to anybody. It's just in a way ideas belong to themselves like a meme. <laughs> so I, I really don't know, but the question of novelty, and that's why it was interesting to me that uh, when you invited me to give this talk, the topic was new poetics, yeah. was there's, there's nothing new. We're constantly writing, doing the same thing over and over, maybe in a different way, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's new, right? I mean, I got a haircut the other day, and now it's like I'm back in 1985. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just a repetition. And I, and I, I think that's okay. I mean, I... I don't feel any any angst for not creating anything particularly new. But in case of academics, yes, because I think am I plagiarizing? 
from that. Well, I, I have to disagree with you about creating something in Ukraine. <laughs> I don't know if, how you all feel about this, but uh, did you feel that there's something new was created in your minds for you in this talk? For me, you drew a connection between bacteria and data and between <laughs> invisible victims under freeways and the blank space in a form. And those four things for me, they shape a, a square now. Uh, that I've never seen before. It's a new kind of square. So maybe somebody else did think about this, right? Eh? Maybe I just said it first. I don't know. But you made me feel like I'm thinking <laughs> something new. You, 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 so you gave me uh, inspiration, right? And 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 that's you know maybe somebody else had that inspiration before too, but I didn't, and you made the difference. Yeah. Well, so. that's the role of art, right? I mean, I wouldn't be doing any poetry if I wasn't hoping to make us feel the same. Ah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you did make me feel it. Oh. How did anybody else feel? Anybody else feel different? Yeah, any comments? I'm not sure how this relates to your work exactly, but I do research where I have to ask p p p p people to fill out forms a lot, mm -hmm. um, and it made me think about how I've been just beating a dead 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 horse with the way I write forms and how it's so boring and I could be doing so much more um with the medium of the form so in the next two hours after this I have a slot where I have to work want to um so I'm gonna go write a cool form now so yes absolutely thing. um but I have a question for you that wasn't super related but um the those like Inter interaction with the form some, somehow to me feels like a very intimate thing because it's like me and my screen in my house may, maybe in my bed right um and i know no it isn't but the whole exper experience reminded me of like passing notes in class where you write to your friend they write something back what they write cha changes what you write, write but all of that is sort of conditioned by how you need to not get in trouble if it gets caught and read out loud, which to me is like the aspect of all your date, date, date data is being collected. So I was cur curious if you passed notes in class at, as a kid and sort of how you came to th thinking in these like ways and expanding it to the way you do art now. Okay, cool. Thank you for that question. Um, okay. Uh, I don't, I don't, remember clearly if I pass notes, I mean, I most I did. I remember always being punished for talking too much in class and being sort of put in a corner kind of thing. Um, you know, European education is different to American education. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I see what you mean about creating a space that is intimate, yet you're not really sure about the limits of that intimacy. And that's not just with forms, right? It happens with everything that we do online. We think, oh, I'm just going to text my friend this picture of me. But you really don't know where that is going. Or you're just going to video chat, but you don't know what that video feed is going to, what server in what country, and what the regulations of the, that country that are hosting that data are, right? Or what was going to happen to it. So the same thing with the survey. I write it, and because it's so different it becomes immediately personalized right and i really try to make it sound very much like me so you are completing it being aware that it is that you're talking to me but that data i collect and then also the platforms keep right so yeah in a way it's like the teacher looking at the notes and reading it out loud and i think that is something for us to always keep in mind that when we're doing anything in a digital space everybody's watching everybody's watching they may not be human eyes right it's not like there's a person being there collecting the data and being like oh look what you said but <laughs> they're always watching they're always listening your phone's always recording what you're saying anyway so you know it's uh, kind of creepy if you think about it but just don't think about it <laughs> yeah oh, that was a beautiful question yeah Thank you for this talk. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I, at the beginning, you mentioned a few times um, like predictive intelligence and predictive marketing, and then you also followed that with the question, "How do tools shape our thinking?" So I was wondering if, while you're, uh, you know, writing this poetry, making these works of art, you find yourself 
um, this is kind of you know similar to uh, Professor Niemeyer's question, but if you find yourself thinking in a way that um, reflects the medium of your artwork, maybe, and I kind of feel like this ties back to the lecture that we heard from uh, Elisa Jardina Papa, I want to say, mm -hmm. where she was working um, as as a computer trainer, and then she found herself in her daily life uh, categorizing things as she would do in her work. And, and so I was just wondering um, about if you found your, yourself, uh, you know, taking on maybe some of the characteristics of the medium of your artwork. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And yes, of course, I mean, the whole uh, poem that you took about, you know, the potential ideas and things that live in your gut does exactly that, right? I mean, I, I look at what Qualtrics has as a template for product concept testing, which is a thing, right? Like you're gonna create a new sneakers and you have the same kind of model with like a slight variation and you ask a group of people to test that and say, oh, these, these are the sneakers that people like because they make them feel and then they rate how you feel, right? Powerful or interesting or cool or whatever. And that again gets, re, gets distilled, reparsed, and they tune the questions to get better data, right? And get better answers and so on and so forth. And when I saw that template, of course, you know, I thought, well, I'm gonna do something with this. It's so interesting, it's so corporate. And it's also, um, there's a, a, a high element of co-authorship with the template and the algorithms that are gonna help me fine tune, you know, my next set of questions. So I did it in a way that was very obvious, right? And that's why the experience is also sort of more dreary than the other thing you saw room two or any of the other poems, right? Because in that particular poem, there's less of me and there's more of them, right? That's why when I was thinking of that, all these other things that are less of me, but me came to mind. You know, the fact that we coexist with bacteria, so many different kinds of tiny little things that are not you, but they just come to inhabit you, right? That's kind of creepy. And so again, I was pregnant at the time. I actually like my baby is just outside there. And that sounds terrible, but anyways, you know what I mean? Uh, being taken care of, you know, like alone. Um, uh, but I was also inhabited by something that somehow I made, but it wasn't me and it was gonna come out and be its own thing with new bacteria, right? So, <laughs> so that idea of making with others was very present and, and I hope the form shows it, right? Um, when I gave that to some friends at the beginning to test at the beginning, I was getting all the time that, oh, this is too boring. You should just give three options or, you know, randomize it more or, and I was like, no, no, because it has to be boring. So you realize that there's also an other that there's an ulterior motive here that and then so on so yeah thank you and there's one question up there yeah right next to you perfect thank you um just on the topic of coexisting in an age where technology is gaining more momentum and moving at such a fast pace, how do you feel like we as human species can coexist with technology and digital tools that are basically helping us in, in expressing our creativity and sharing our gifts to the world? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question and a really scary one because I feel a lot of the time that I just wanna run away from all technology, mainly because of this, um, well, there's two things. There's the environmental question that I pose there because right now it's unsustainable. Our technological progress is unsustainable and digital technologies, again, because they present themselves in this very um, immaterial way, right? I mean, where are they? <laughs> yeah, it's not this, it's the cloud, it's, where is it? Blah, blah, blah. We, we consume them in a way that is less obvious because the the body is distributed and the result is not immediate as in like, you know, burning some wood in front of you. Um, but they are contributing to terrible environmental damage and that this is something that does trouble me, right? I mean, a way to think about it too will be to fuel them with clean energy and so on. So this is, but we're not doing that. 
So how to coexist with technology in that sense is problematic, and, and I, I really don't know. And then how to think about it in the way that it is changing how we're thinking. And a lot of the time, this question comes with how does artificial intelligence work and how we can create something that we don't understand and eventually, you know, <laughs> stops, stops thinking the same way that we're thinking and how do we think with that. But as I was saying, it is always co it is, it's, it's always a coexistence, right? I mean, we, we're not acting or thinking or saying the same way that we did before having a pen and pencil and a notebook and so on. So we are changing. We're not the same type of humans either, right? We're not like um, a super machine robot cyborg human or anything like that, but we're entering a different stage as well. And I don't think that is a terrible thing. I, I don't, we may be different. We may relate different to other things as we did in the past, but that's not, that's not bad, you know? I don't, I don't see it as bad. I don't know. Yeah, it's a tricky question, and I think I did a terrible answer, but that's all right. <laughs> there's so much, there's such a vast subject, and it's, but um, I had another question, and I, I wanted to ask quickly. So when I read your biography, and, and I thought about how you grew up in, in Spain, obviously, and up until 1976, people in Spain were discouraged from speaking English or learning English, I think, if my history serves me right. Um, it wasn't a big thing to learn Spanish, uh, to, to learn English. Yeah. But then after Franco, uh, his regime ended, uh, English became uh, a, a way to, to participate in global commerce and culture and so forth. And for you, of course, the whole, your whole practice seems to be in English at this point. So is there something about the whole language that, that you, and the ideology of a language that you that you're um, leveraging here as you're practicing mostly in English, or is there a whole different set of poems that you're making that are in Spanish, or um, how does how does your relationship to the language inform your work? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question, and it is something that I I struggle with because I have tried to write poetry in Spanish. It's just not very good, and and I don't know why. I don't know why, um, personally. I mean, I understand that the argument about, obviously, the different hierarchies of power embedded in language, because this you know, language is a type of um, imperial tool. And of course, when you go to digital technologies, also the presence of English seems to be the, the primordial language. And right now, even in academia, for example, it's sort of our uh, language that we can use to understand each other regardless of our scientific communities and things like that. So there is something about that and the fact that I'm using English to do digital poetry. But regardless of that, like I said, I have tried to write in Spanish and it just doesn't, I don't have the same voice. But it's not, you see, my dad is British and I grew up at home speaking English as well. Um, so it's not, it's a foreign language because I was in Spain and he would use this language with me and I would just answer back in Spanish, but it was kind of there, right? And then when I came to live in the United States, uh, my professional self got developed more and more in English. And so my training as a writer uh, kind of got reinforced in English. And then some, somehow that change in creating a strange language that is not quite English, not quite Spanish, but has English words. And that's the one that I sort of express myself poetically. And I honestly don't know because that's a very personal question. And I just, the answer is that whenever I try to write in Spanish, poetry just doesn't, like I try to translate these. I was like, I'm gonna translate this and do the same thing, form in Spanish just doesn't sound good. It just doesn't sound at all. And I, I don't, why is it? Why is it that rich mineral soil, blue, just doesn't, there's nothing poetic about it in English either, yet it sounds poetic. I don't know. I don't know. Because English is a really good language. <laughs> Well, in, in a way, that always I, Spanish. I mean, Spanish viewers, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's just different. It has a different structure. Different voice. It's less modular. Maybe that's why. Um, in, in this answer, you actually said a lot about coexistence that may also apply to 
to technology. So thank you so much. I, th I think we're good. Any other questions? Um, so um, let's let's give um, Alex another round of applause and thank you so much for inspiring us. Thank you. It was Thanks wonderful. So and to all of you here in, in class, I just want to mention that uh, uh, you should enjoy your fall break. It's going to be a week of fall break and then we'll resume again on uh, Tuesday, November 30th.